First up, we have Casey Schaufler. Look out for what's in the security pipeline. Please welcome Casey. Okay, so this is the official template version, but we'll give you this one here so you can actually read it. Uh, who am I? Oh, first off, my notice. Um, uh, there have been a couple of very high profile security issues in the press lately. Um, you may have heard about them if you're paying attention. Uh, I regret that I am not at liberty to make comment or answer questions on, any, uh, on either of these, and I'm not even supposed to use their names. I wish that weren't funny. <clears throat> so, who am <laughs> Who am I? I'm Casey Schaufler. I was uh, working on Unix kernels in the 1970s, uh, was involved in the very first uh, commercial port to a 32-bit system. Let that soak in. I uh, started working on security in the 1980s, um, Linux early in the, in the 21st century. So uh, I've been, a, been around a while on this, seen a lot of interesting things come in. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about the security industry is it tends to, to have uh, cycles with regard to whether it's interesting and being funded or whether it's not interesting and not being funded. Right now, we're actually in one of those fortunate uh, eras when it's interesting and being funded. Uh, and in the light of that, we're seeing a lot of interesting things starting to come down the pike. So I'm going to just kind of start off here with talking about some of the old security modules that we've that have been around for a while, a little bit about what's going on in them. And again, if, if I say anything that is not true or misrepresentative or in some way maybe not correct, you can shout it out if you, if you really want to. I, I don't embarrass very easily. Uh, so the first thing is with, with SE Linux. Um, how many of you are familiar with SE Linux? OK, great. Um, with SE Linux, uh, relatively stable, we do adding some new network protocols. A um, little bit of work's going on with uh, making policy easier to understand and deal with. A lot of that's come out of the Android work. Um, and there are a couple of other things which I'll, I'll get to in just a little bit here. Uh, not a lot of excitement here. Uh, the SMAC security module, there's not a lot of excitement here either. Um, changes with network configuration. When SMAC was originally implemented, uh, this is mine, by the way. When SMAC, SMAC was originally implemented, um, there were a fairly limited number of things you could do with the net label code, which is what we use to do transmit uh, security information across the network. A lot of work has been done on that, and SMAC hasn't kept up with that. So there's going to be some work there to, to bring SMAC into better line with the way that the, the net label code wants things to be done. And yeah, that's kind of an, an ongoing thing. Um, we have to negotiate exactly how that goes about. By the way, if you're going to drive a uh, 2018 Toyota Camry, it will have smack on it. And I'm not going to tell you in what capacity. Uh, the big, the big uh, changes in the existing security modules have to do with what's going on with AppArmor. AppArmor um, is, was the third uh, security module to, com to come in. It was actually the second security module implemented, uh, but it took it a while to actually get um, accepted into the community. Uh, AppArmor is primarily label-based, or sorry, it's primarily file name based. So if you're going to do access controls in AppArmor, you're going to write your policy based on the names of things rather than the traditional subject object kind of um, controls. And that's really good um, in a lot of ways. Um, there are a lot of people in the community who, who felt that that was probably not the, the best way to go about doing access control. But it actually found a, has found a place and it's actually uh, gaining popularity. Now, uh, in order to do networking, in order to do some of the kinds of controls that you want to do in a persistent file system or uh, between reboots, you really want to have 
some sort of attributes on files and on processes. So it's moving a little bit more into the object labeling, process labeling direction. There's also work going on with, with an interesting notion here, which is policy stacking. So that if you have a container running on your AppArmor system, you can actually have a different policy in the container than you have on the base system. Uh, this is a radical departure from a lot of the way people think about security. People tend to think about security as, here are the rules, we're going to put them in place, you're not going to violate them, that's it. Unless you're up here, in which case we're going to do them a little bit differently. So there's a lot of uh, crying and gnashing of teeth uh, with this. Um, it's a very exciting area because it's taking, it, it, it's showing how security is being taken seriously at not only at the system level, but also at the, the distribution level and then at the deployment level into containers. So we've got new security modules coming. Um, how many of you have, ever, have really tried to look into maybe doing a security module? See, okay, I see, I see the SE Linux guys over here. I see the App Armor guy over here. Um, and I see a couple of guys in the back who are trying to hide. Uh, and that's, that's fine. It, it can be a daunting thing to consider. Uh, if you go through and read, for example, the SE Linux code or the SMAC code or the App Armor code and just see how, how large and, and grandiose they are. But there are a lot of people out there who've decided that the security module, sorry, the security models that we had back in the 1980s and 90s don't apply especially well to the computers that they're deploying today. So we're starting to see some new ideas come in. Ideas that are radical departures from the way we've done security in the past. So the first one I want to talk about is one called Landlock. Uh, Landlock is an EB, EBPF extension to the SecMark scheme. EBPF, um, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. EBPF, you're supposed to know this. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah, it's like, yeah, my acronym processor blew out in the 1990s, and so uh, I, I appreciate the, the question there. Um, so with SecMark, you can say to your process, I don't ever want to execute this system call. And so if your process then later does execute that system call, it'll kill the process. Okay, a very simple, simple, kind, simple minded kind of thing. So if, if you know your, your process is never going to do a fork, and your process does a fork, you know you've been hacked. Or you know something has happened in the environment you're running in. One of the libraries has changed. Who knows what what gone. But there's something going on here that you don't want to have happen. And that's a fairly, very simple way to go about doing things. That's a pretty, very powerful tool. But if you could write a program in there that says, if this parameter starts with the letter J, then I'm out of here. Or if um, the buffer length that I've pa that got passed in is, too, is, longer, is greater than this amount, that means something bad has happened. And having detected that something bad has happened, I, I want out. I want to be gone. So it gives you the ability to put, again, it's a little bit of program. Um, there are no loops in it. So there, it's, a rel, it's a reasonably safe language to write a program in. So you can actually now control what your process is doing under circumstances where you can, you, you've identified that things aren't right. Another one we've got coming in here, uh, this is an almost painfully obvious one called p-tags. And what it, pro what it provides is general purpose tagging for processes. So I can put, so if I'm using p-tags, I can put a tag on a process and I can find out that, that tag from other, about, from other processes or on files. So, if I'm in an application space and I say, I want to only talk to programs that have this tag, or I can find it, I can go, go, to, go to procfs, look at the 
the tags for that program and say, oh, I shouldn't be sending, a, sending any information over to that process because it's got, it doesn't have the right set of tags. Or I can look at the files and say, aha, this file, this file has a tag. My process doesn't have the tag, so I shouldn't be playing with that. It doesn't actually implement any access control. It's just tagging so that the applications can go about using that information to make their own decisions. Uh, the reason why this is really interesting, though, is that a lot of the uses that people put SE Linux to or Smack are all about keeping track of tags. It, be, because you have a label on a process and label on objects in those systems, you can, you can look at that and make a decision based on that in application space. But then you're also dealing with the system access controls that you put into place in order to, to deal with those tags. So by just having a mechanism for doing the tagging, you can take that you know, application space can actually take control over how it uses that, rather than trying to work around the system, pro, the, you know, the system policies that are in place to deal with those. Uh, it's an idea that's actually long overdue. It really does make sense. You, make, you can do program access control lists if you want with this. There are all kinds of good things you can do with, with p-tags if you have them. Way back in the old, old days, um, there was this, uh, a, a system call introduced called Cheroot. And what Cheroot used to do is put, you, put your process into a different uh, rooted root of the file system. And when the only namespace we had was the file system namespace, that was actually a great security feature. Well, since then, we've got System 5 IPC objects, and we've got sockets, and we've got a veritable plethora of other things. Um, th these are in the days before we had slash, slash proc, for example. So it used to be that if you changed the root of your file system, you were golden. It's like you actually had a secure, you actually had a secure space there. You could actually isolate using it. And as we've added features to the files, added features, um, you know, slash proc, uh, system 5 IPC sockets, now all of a sudden we're in a situation where Cheroot doesn't help much. And it's gotten to the point where there are a lot of people, some of you I'm sure, don't know that Cheroot is actually a security feature. Um, because it does, it's not very good at it right now. So hard Cheroot is a, is a security module which puts limits on all of the things that have come along since Cheroot that make it so Cheroot is now again actually uh, something you can use to enforce, a, enforce security. It's got mount restrictions. Um, F -chitter, or sorry, F Cheroot doesn't work anymore, which is a kind of a big plus. Some of the other um, file descriptor-based uh, system calls, fchmod, aren't allowed to work outside of you know, the, the, uh, the new root. So it's, this is kind of a fix up the stuff that's been done incorrectly over the, over the years so that now it is, is useful again. Safe name. Um, this is actually one of my favorites. Has anybody in the room ever had a control G in a path name? <laughs> Don't you just hate it when you do LS and it goes beep, 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 beep? Um, or, or had a, a file name with a, with a space at the end, or in the middle for that matter. I'm just like, who, whose idea was that? Oh. No, actually, they're not the worst. No, non-blocking non -blocking spaces aren't the worst. Form feeds are the worst. But has anybody ever worked on a paper terminal? With actually, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> all the old guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you put a form feed into, into the path name, and, and yeah, poof, ah! Yeah, and you had to pay for the paper, too. That's like, those were the days. Yeah, or... Um, Yeah, so what, what safe name allows you to do is specify, is to, to some extent, specify what characters you're going to allow in a path name. So no trailing blanks, if, that, if that's what you want. Uh, no leading, leading dashes. 
A file name that's called dash dash help is really hard to get rid of or work with. Um, now, of course, we, it, it's not going to be foolproof. You're not going to be able to, to, to uh, prevent things like Cthulhu and Voldemort uh, from being file names. But it will take care of most of the annoying things that you find in path names. Now, you're going to have to be careful with this, of course, because there are, there are some communities that really like putting spaces in their file names and uh, special characters at the beginning of their, their file names. And this isn't for everybody, but boy, there are sure going to be a lot of cases where this is going to be, be pretty helpful. Now, people will, like, will, I think, like this. Another one is simple flow. Um, how many of you have heard of the concept of an information label? Same guys. Uh, okay, well, they're, they're familiar faces. I know all these people. Um, they, they don't get enough exercise, so we have to, have to keep doing that. Um, simple flow uh, is an implementation of a fairly rudimentary information label. So an information label tells you something about the information rather than about the container. So if you're using SC Linux, it puts, it puts labels on containers. If you're using Smack, it puts labels on containers. Um, simple flow keeps track of the sensitivity or integrity or some other aspect of the data. So if I write, if, if I create a container, it of course has no information label on. If I put data into it from one source, it will, yeah, be, you'll get the uh, information label of, of that data. Uh, if you put a different set of information, you may, you may come in and say, you know what, I can't say that this information has this level of integrity anymore because I've also mixed it in with this, so yeah, all bets are off, it's tainted. Or you may start my start off putting tainted data in and then put in putting golden data and the golden data is going to wipe out the taint um, which it's it's very difficult to manage very difficult to manage well uh, but if you keep it simple and don't try to go overboard you can actually do some very interesting things with this you can actually do some tracking of the level of information especially if you're very careful about what you mean when you say something's tainted or when something's bad. So it actually gives you quite a bit of power. But again, it's a very different mindset. Yeah, I've got a question over here. Um, well, so, so, so the comment here is that this would work for security classifications. And the answer to that is sort of. Uh, back in the 19... 80s, yes, back in way back when, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and and MIPS was a large unit of computing. Um, there was actually a specification put out by a, a U.S. government agency on using information labels as opposed to sensitivity labels, because the problem with the sensitivity labels is that everything flows up immediately. Okay, if you go into a DoD site, for example. Hypothetically, uh, and somebody writes, put, writes on a, a yellow sticky that um, there are donuts in the break room. Okay, depending on who is writing that note and where they are when they write it and who they give it to, that may all of a sudden become classified. Even though the inform, you know, the information is itself completely harmless. Well, unless you're to lose it. But uh, it, it's completely harmless information. But because of where it came from, because of the container it's in, it, you know, it, you're on a, the, the sticky you got happens to have top secret written on the top of it. Now that information is top secret because it's, the, it's tainted by the container. So um, something like SE Linux you know, with the, the uh, MLS component added is a better choice for doing that. Because, the, because, again, the information does tend to flow up. 
And that's why you need simple flow as opposed to full up information labels. Because full up information labels, you know, as soon as you, you snap your fingers, bang, it's, it's tainted in some way. Actually, the prototype that, was, that this government agency did, um, they had to run the shell with root privilege so that the prompt wouldn't, printing the prompt wouldn't raise the uh, information label of the screen uh, up to the level, the clearance of the person using it. Uh, it, it again, it's something that in reality you have to, in, in real life, you have to be really careful with this. Um, we're also doing some work in the security infrastructure. Uh, not that it, what we have isn't perfect, uh, it's just that there are ways, even though if it's perfect, you can always make it better. Right? And there, there are things we want to do these days that even as, as recently as a year ago, people were saying, oh, that's crazy. Why would anybody want to do that? Uh, turns out people want to do it. So um, probably the biggest thing we're working on, uh, okay, I'm working on. I'm blowing my own. Fine. Okay. Biggest thing I'm working on. Security module stacking. So let's say you want to have SE. Of course, nobody would want to have AppArmor and Smack and SE Linux on the same system at the same time. But let's just say you did. Okay. Or let's say you wanted to have SE Linux and Landlock, which is a much better example, okay. on the system at the same time. Unfortunately, the way the infrastructure is currently set up, there's no way to share the additional information that the security modules need to have between two modules. So the first thing that has to get done uh, to do security module stack is move, moving the blob, we call these things the blobs. Move the blobs, blob management out of the individual security modules and into the infrastructure. So that if you've got two modules that want to use um, a task blob or an inode blob, they're not the ones that are allocating it. The system is out, the infrastructure is allocating it for them so they can use it. Um, they can use it any way they want to, but the system, the system is giving it to them. It's working it for them so that they don't have to actually do it anymore. And that way you can have more than one. Uh, another thing is uh, the net filter system uh, has SE Linux specific uh, specification in it. Um, actually, if you actually go into the NetFilter code, it says if, you're, if this is for SE Linux, great. Otherwise, um, gee, I don't, have, don't know what to do with it. So we're, we're just going to fail. Uh, actually, Smack is abusing it at this point, uh, pretending to be SE Linux. Uh, and that works so long as you're not share, not, you don't actually have both of them. Uh, but App Armor is going to, as App Armor is coming in, wants to use this. We don't have, you know, that's just not there yet. So that's uh, one of the areas we need to take into account. Uh, and then the third one, this one's kind of interesting. There is a mechanism called net label whereby we can put uh, Cipso or Calypso um, headers on IP packets and hence transmit security information about what's uh, yeah, about your process when you send a packet off off into the ether. And so you get a packet from, you know, out from somebody else and it tells you it's got information or you can tell security information about who sent it. Um, and that works, that, that works really nicely, but when, if you have, for example, some Mac and SE Linux at the same time, well, not example, it's the, the only case right now, uh, you can't necessarily tell which one you're talking about. So there needs to be a way to, to make, make sure that the two modules that are looking at this information agree that it's acceptable you know, when you get you know, this particular um, CIPSO option, that they can both interpret it. Um, and when you send it, you need to make sure that it's OK that they're in agreement on what should go into that packet. Um, that's actually a harder problem than it sounds. Um, we have a couple of ways. You know, unlabeled packets are not a problem. Uh, packets where we're using local uh, loopback labeling are not a problem. But anything that comes off the network that has a CIPSO option, 
uh, you have a definite possibility for grief. And if you wanted to say, well, we'll just make sure that the, the two systems are in sync with what they're doing, you know, use the same representation, um, Smack and SC Linux use very different granularities with setting labels on processes. Um, very different mechanisms for determining what label gets put onto a process. So keeping that in sync is really a fairly difficult problem. And if somebody wants to work on that, that would be a great idea, a great thing. Uh, we could, we could use, definitely use some help on that. Uh, so, yes, oh, okay, up, oh, up. Oh. Ah! You, you got off my groove. Got me off my groove. Okay, yes. I'll repeat your question. It, no. No, that's that's a problem in NetFilter. Okay, in, but, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so the question the question was that I had said that that Smack is pretending to be SE Linux. Uh, that's with regard to NetFilter. NetFilter is a mechanism for doing packet filtering, um, which is distinct from the net label code, which is about actually labeling things on the network. So, yeah, NetFilter you can do all sorts of um, perverse and unnatural things. Um, the uh, the CIPSO labeling is, is a little bit very specific, you know, single purpose here. And that's just a matter of the way the code's, code's working. So let's see here. I think I got through. Okay, so one of the reasons you want to do this is uh, security module namespaces. Let's say, just for grins, that I want to run a container which is enforcing app armor on top of the system, which is um, has a base policy that's SE Linux. Now, why would I want to do that? I hear you cry. I don't know either, but we're getting asked for it. In the past year, maybe year and a half, people have come out of the woodwork and said, containers are great, containers are wonderful, we love containers, boom. Now, we want to run different, poli different security policies in our containers than we run on the base system. And we don't necessarily want to run the same base uh, mechanism on the, in the containers as we do on the base system or in each other. Uh, this is really kind of a revelation because this is very different from anything we've heard ever before. Uh, but we're, looking to, we're, we're going to do our best to step up to the challenge. Okay, okay. The, uh, Mr. Howells here is, is reminding me that a lot of this has to do with moving containers around. Uh, if you have 14, 14 machines running 60 million containers, or whatever the current limit is, for, uh, 15, I guess, 15 containers, uh, you don't necessarily want them to be on the same machine all the time. Um, so you want to have the policy that the container is enforcing be consistent with itself and the system that is running having the policy. It's, it's running consistent. Actually, yeah, let me, let me get back to this because I'm running low on time. Okay, if we've got time, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, namespacing in SE Linux. Uh, James Morris, uh, who's sitting right behind uh, Jonathan here, will uh, be talking about that later today. So I'm not going to go into that in any more detail. Uh, we also have encrypted keys coming in. This is uh, kind of an interesting thing where we have a we have key rings, but we are not necessarily protecting the keys and the key rings to the extent that we'd like to. So this is getting beefed up rather considerably. So, let, speaking of containers, let's talk about containers. Anybody here use containers? Anybody here not use containers? Good for you. Uh, why do I say that? Well, what is a container? Um, how many of you think that a container is anything that's based off of a user namespace? Okay. 
How many of you think that, container, that a container is required to use namespaces? Okay, does anybody have a clue what a container is? Okay, this is the kernel boff, yes! Okay. We don't know. Not only do we not know, but we have been explicitly told at length in public forums at Linux Plumbers this year that whatever else we did, we were not to make containers be a kernel construct. We could do anything else we wanted, but under no circumstances were containers to be kernel constructs. Now, does that mean that kernels can't care about containers? Well, no, it doesn't. Because at the exact same time that we were being told that, kernel, that containers are not kernel constructs, we were being told we had to, we had to support them. Uh, okay, so one of the big things that, that's been going on, and this is a fairly important one, is what happens when you have capabil a capability set on a file, on a program file, and that's run from a container? Well, it gets the capabilities. Well, but what does that mean in a container context? Uh, well, it means that you apply the, regular, the rules. Well, but what if I want to have different rules in my container than I have on the base system? Oh boy, so now we're, now we're, we're getting to the point where we're going, they're going to be supporting a prefix, which is the, con the container name, onto the capability attribute on a file so that you say these capabilities apply to this program when it's run in this container. That's starting to get a bit complicated. Um, but, you know, containers are the world, you know, so we're uh, moving forward on this. Um, next thing here is identification. And this was, was the thing that we really got kind of hammered on here, is if I have a container and it's, and it's doing, performing security relevant actions and generating audit records, I want to be able to identify them as part as happening in the container rather than just on the system because, well, I, I really should be able to separate those out, especially because the security policy that's being enforced within the container is different from the base system. And so you can look at, a, at an audit record from an event that failed in a container and go, why did that fail? The system policy allows that. Well, the container policy doesn't. So that's a level of complication that um, makes, makes it extremely difficult for somebody who's reading the audit trail to determine. So talk about putting a, an identifier of some sort into the kernel to identify containers. Uh, there's talk about using a 264-bit ID. I personally suggested that they say they use p tags to identify things. Um, there are a lot of options. How, you, how are we going to go about doing it? It hasn't been decided yet. But this is definitely kernel support for a non-kernel entity, which is a container. Um, we'll see how well that flies, see what we end up with here. Um, the audit trails are really kind of difficult enough to deal with as it is. Uh, we don't want to do it. We want to do something that, that doesn't make it even worse. And finally, there are a number of um, organizations, a number of projects going on that are using virtualization technology to enhance the container experience. Um, now, we can do this because we haven't defined what a container is. Uh, how is a virtual machine a container? Well, how is um, a sandbox a container? Now, I can do an S build an SE Linux sandbox, which if you uh, go out through the look through all the details of what a container is, an SE Linux sandbox is a container. Uh, a small, lightweight virtual machine, that can be a container too. Um, yeah, we're all good with that because it's a user space cons construct and this is the kernel boff. Okay, so uh, no talk on Linux kernel security would be complete without a little bit of talk, a little bit on hardening. Um, first thing I want to talk about on hardening though is uh, printing pointers. 
Uh, it's been a lot of work on this. Um, it actually went through several iterations as to how it should be done. Um, Linus was very, very adamant that it be a, be a mechanism where you couldn't, you didn't have to opt in uh, to protect pointers. That you actually had to had to go well out of your way to uh, violate the the policy if you were going to do that. So the problem with printing pointers is that if you print kernel pointer values in the error, in a in the syslog, you're providing a treasure map for somebody who's, who wants to break or exploit the system. Uh, the more information they have about where data is in the kernel, the easier it is to go find the thing that you need to go, go tweak a little bit so that you can now um, do bad things. Now, I don't do any of that myself. I don't really understand how, how all that stuff works. It's all magic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I do. But it is pretty obvious that if you, the more information you have about what's where things are, the easier it's going to be to to go out and get that. So, the current the the new mechanism is that you don't get real pointer values when you do a percent p. Uh, you get a hash of what's there, and there are mechanisms for those very few cases where you really really do want to print the pointer value. Uh, but in general, it's making it more difficult for people to find out where things are. OK. Um, another one is user copy. Uh, user copy is one of my personal favorites because you tell the kernel how much space, go read these 40, 48 bytes from this location. Or go put these 48 bytes. Here, here are 48 bytes, put them in your buffer. And if I know that your buffer's, the kernel's buffer is only 32 bytes, and the kernel goes, yeah, well, I can do that. Well, it goes and does it, and everything goes crash, and, and there's crying and gnashing of teeth. So we really want to take that exploitable wear out of uh, the way the kernel works. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on to make this happen. Um, uh, if, more on the state of kernel self-protection, by the way. Um, I, I just kind of gave you a little bit of little bit sample there. You know, tease you to go in and talk, listen to Case Cook's talk on Friday uh, about this, because he's going to tell you all kinds of really good stuff there that's, that's well beyond my comprehension. Oh, and uh, by the way, be sure to attend my retrospective talk uh, on Wednesday. Um, and I think that with that, I had a question over here that I squelched earlier. But, well, we got a microphone. You failed me. Oh, there we go. All right, perfect. So the use case that um, we're seeing clients ask for App Armor as well as um, SE Linux stacks on containers as, uh, as well as other use cases is, is in VNFs. So you have a, v a vendor go off and make a VNF appliance, and then they'll you'll audit it with AppArmor or AC Linux, one of the two, and then they'll go and uh, try and install it in a DC somewhere, and they're using AC Linux. So they need to be able to support the, the, this kind of QA effort that these vendors have done on their appliances that they're loading. That's where we're seeing this asked of us as, a, as an integrator quite often. Thank you. So. Um, we have time for one more? Uh, maybe for one more question, one we'll more. go into the five minute break time. Okay. Mr. Cook. Less of a question, more of a uh, comment. I've, I've scheduled a boff for Tuesday over lunch if anyone else wants to talk about kernel hardening and kernel security things. Um, so show up to that, check the wiki. Thanks. All right, well, I'm informed I'm out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. You've been a lovely audience. <laughs>